This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nano Fabrication. I'm Chris Mack, your professor for this class, and this is Lecture 20, Part 1 of our two-part series on evaporation as a method of uh, depositing materials in semiconductor manufacturing. The reading is Chapter 12. The first half of Chapter 12 of our test textbook by Campbell covers evaporation. second half of that chapter will cover the next topic on sputtering. So there are many different techniques for depositing different kinds of films on a semiconductor wafer. And we're going to talk about all of them eventually in this class. One technique is electrochemical deposition. Uh, this is the technique we use for depositing copper on the wafers. And copper is used as the metallization of choice um, in more advanced integrated circuits. Originally, uh, aluminum was the most common metallization material, um, but in the last uh, 20 years, uh, since the mid to late 90s, we've switched to copper as the dominant material because of its lower resistivity. We have to deposit this electrochemically. We'll talk about that in a later section of the class. Another very important technique we'll spend a lot of time on is chemical vapor deposition. Here, chemical reactions occur on the surface of the wafer, and uh, a film is deposited. Uh, the CVD is done in furnaces similar to oxidation and um, um, diffusion furnaces. But today we're going to begin our discussion of physical vapor deposition, or PVD. And there are two physical vapor deposition types, sputtering and evaporation. Uh, as the name implies, this deposition technology does not rely on chemistry, but physical processes to deposit the material. Sputtering is the most important. We'll talk about that next, but the next two lectures uh, are on evaporation. What is evaporation? Well, it was an early technique. It was very commonly used in the early days of the semiconductor industry. It's less common today in manufacturing. It's still very important in R&D. Uh, you'll find lots of evaporation systems uh, in universities. Uh, because it's simple and inexpensive. Um, we also use evaporation in very important areas of manufacturing of other types of devices, components. Uh, particularly, we use evaporation for coating most of the mirrors that are used in optical systems, uh, from inexpensive optical systems to very uh, high-end uh, astronomy systems. Um, so it's still a very important technique. Um, we're going to study it here for its historical relevance, uh, for uh, its use in R&D and in universities, um, but also because many of the important ideas associated with evaporation we'll be able to also incorporate, incorporate when we study sputtering, which is the more common technique used for depositing uh, these kinds of materials in semiconductor manufacturing. With evaporation, the operation is performed in a vacuum. We have a charge, the material that we, we want to deposit. We put it in a crucible and heat it up until it melts. And because it's in a vacuum and it's melted, it will evaporate, and this evaporated material will spread out in all directions. And when this vapor hits a cold wafer, it sticks and deposits a film. It's commonly used for metal deposition, but it can also be used for uh, dielectrics as well of certain types. The um, evaporation system looks something like this. We have a large bell jar. In the old days, these bell jars were glass, and you can actually see in them, see what was going on. But I think it's more common that the bell jar uh, chamber is made out of metal today. The wafers are generally arranged in, a, in the form of a planetarium. Um, we have lots of wafers in one system. You can have single wafer systems as well, but in any kind of uh, manufacturing environment, we would have lots of wafers uh, covering the whole uh, inside of this bell jar. The uh, melt is the charge placed in a crucible. Here I show uh, uh, resistive heating. I just have current going in and uh, the high resistance of this material means that it gets hot if I use a high current. Hundreds of amps a high current. Um, I can melt this material and once it melts it a vapor comes off in all directions because this is in a vacuum. In the vacuum, I have a roughing pump followed by, that gets 
most of the air out, followed by a diffusion or a cryo pump or turbo, turbo molecular pump um, to get it down to a high vacuum. The first thing we need to do, think about, is the melting of the charge. This turns out to be pretty important um, because if you don't do it right, you can get a lot of bad results. Uh, the simplest way, as I mentioned in the last slide, was to run current through the crucible. You have a crucible made out of, say, tungsten. You run current through it, it gets hot and it melts the charge. Well, that works okay if the melting point of this material is very low. Aluminum has a fairly low melting point. But if the melting point is even reasonably high, refractory metals, for example, have high melting points, then this crucible is getting very hot and the crucible can sublimate at these high temperatures. That means I'll have some tungsten contaminating the film that I'm trying to deposit. That's often a very bad thing depending on what it is you're making. We can try to heat the melt without heating up the crucible as much. We can inductively heat the charge with RF energy. This reduces but does not eliminate the crucible heating. Therefore the preferred technique if we want high quality, high purity films to be deposited is E-beam evaporation. Let me explain what E-beam evaporation means. E-beam is electron beam evaporations and I've got some filament, some source of electrons. So if I put a filament um, in, a, in a vacuum, uh, you'll, you'll extract electrons uh, off of that filament and if I send them through a, a, a little aperture and apply a magnetic field, I can get this, uh, just like we saw in the mass spec uh, of the ion implanter, we can get the electrons to move in a curved path, uh, magnetic field perpendicular to the direction of motion of the electrons produces a V cross B force that is always perpendicular to the direction that the electrons are traveling in and that sends them off in this curve path. <coughs> Excuse me. Run that in just the right way, I can land on top of the melt. Bombarding the charge with electrons melts the material and the result is a melted material in a vapor. Unlike the other techniques, I'm not heating from the bottom, I'm heating from the top. That's where the electrons impinge and so I can get a melt on the top that is completely surrounded by solid charge. I can even water cool the crucible so that the crucible will stay cool and only the melt will be hot. That eliminates the problem of contamination in the film and you get a better quality film as a result. This technique, E-beam evaporation, is not without its own problems however. When I bombard the metal, usually a metal in the, in the crucible, the charge, uh, with electrons. It melts it, but it also generates secondary electrons that go off in lots of directions, and x-rays. Both of these um, side effects can damage the wafer, especially critical parts of the wafer, like the insulator of an MS transistor, uh, transistor the gate oxide. We essentially never use evaporation on wafers that have a gate oxide on them for this reason. It, it can be very damaging. Here's a picture of uh, an EVM evaporation source. You can see the filament here. Uh, apply current. The, the crucible uh, where we put our, our charge. Uh, it's uh, cooled and uh, this whole area will be cooled as well as the crucible. Uh, and here we show actually four different chambers so that you can have different materials and you can switch between them uh, when you're doing deposition. Uh, for the sake of contamination, you have one setup, you always want to deposit the same material. Uh, oh, why is this one all gold looking? I think you could probably guess. This is a chamber that's used for depositing gold. Stick gold in here and of course it coats not only the wafers but everything else. Uh, this is some other material, maybe it's aluminum. Uh, so each of these different chambers deposit different materials and so they get coated and colored in, in different ways. Now we can use evaporation for depositing alloys as well. Uh, we simply put an alloy in the charge. 
Well, there's some problems with that, right? Alloys have different components, and the different components can melt at different temperatures and have different evaporation rates. So the, the composition of the material being deposited may not be the same as the composition of the material you stuck in the crucible. One solution to that is to use multiple crucibles instead of just one. We can have them independently heated so that we can, by controlling the temperature, try to adjust the uh, composition of the material by adjusting the evaporation rates of the individual crucibles. But that's hard to do. Controlling the deposition rate is difficult because it's hard to control the temperature as accurately as needed. And the result is uh, uh, it's difficult to get a consistent composition in our alloys. Well, that brings up the topic of deposition control. If we want to achieve uh, uniform thickness uh, and the proper thickness at the end, how do we do that? Well, the deposition rate, the rate at which the material grows on the wafer, is a, a strong function of the temperature of the melt, uh, which is difficult to control, as I said. One solution to this, though, is instead of trying to control all the inputs, but is to rather measure the output and use a feedback loop, a process control solution. We'll, in real time, measure the deposited thickness of the material, and when we reach the target thickness, we simply turn off the deposition. The easy way to do that is with a shutter. We simply have a metal plate that we can put right above the, um, the, the melting charge and close the shutter. It turns it off. We always use that shutter to turn on the deposition when we first heat up the melt. Uh, until it gets to full temperature, we, we leave this uh, shutter in place. And only when it's evaporating at a consistent rate do we open the shutter and begin the deposition process. How do we measure the thickness in real time? The most common technique is the quartz crystal microbalance. As the name imply, implies, it's got a quartz crystal, and quartz crystals can be turned into oscillators, uh, just like a crystal watch. Uh, as, a, as a very accurate timepiece, we can get a quartz crystal that oscillates at a very specific frequency. And we can measure that frequency of oscillation. Now, when you deposit material on top of a crystal, quartz crystal, that extra mass dampens the vibration. You can imagine something vibrating very fast, and now you put some mass on it, it's going to vibrate a little slower. So the frequency of vibration is directly proportional to the mass, or inversely proportional, actually, to the mass of the deposited material. And the mass of the deposited material, since we have a constant area, is proportional to the thickness. So we can use the quartz crystal microbalance in a very precise measurement of the frequency of its oscillation as a way of measuring the thickness. And this is a very commonly done and, and a quite accurate method. Here's a couple of pictures of some evaporation equipment. Uh, this, one of them is made by Varian, the other is made by Vico. Uh, these are kind of old because, uh, again, commercially, um, these techniques are not as popular in the semiconductor industry anymore. Uh, the bell jars up here, uh, you can see our metal chambers. Um, and the vacuum pumps for pumping down will be found in these two uh, uh, hidden under here where you can't see them. And then we have some controls that uh, automate the process of pumping down the chamber and starting the, and stopping the deposition. So let's look at what we've learned so far. We've gone through the basics of what evaporation is. Uh, you should be able to quickly answer these questions. If you can't, you might need to go back and review the material. What are the three common deposition methods used in semiconductor manufacturing? What are the different methods for melting the charge in evaporation? And what are their advantages and disadvantages? Explain how E-beam evaporation works, how the source for E-beam evaporation works. And finally, how is film thickness controlled in an evaporation system? Next time, we'll talk, uh, finish up our discussion of 
e-beam evap excuse me evaporation in general um, by talking about the mean free path and about deposition rates. Till then.